Hi, welcome to another Authors at Google Talk here at Irvine. Today we are welcoming Lawrence Roberts, author of The Great Housing Bubble. Lawrence lives in Irvine, California with his wife and son, where he witnessed the rise and fall of residential home prices from ground zero of the housing bubble. He works as a consultant to the land development industry. He has worked on the evaluation, acquisition, development, and disposition of over $100 million in real estate assets since 1993. Mr. Roberts holds a Master's of Science in Land Development from Texas A&M University. He is also an experienced securities trader and a student of financial markets and the role of psychology in the fluctuation of asset prices. The author's education and experience makes him uniquely qualified to offer analysis on real estate related matters. Please welcome Larry Roberts. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for having me here at the, the office of Google here in Irvine. And much I'm, my name is Larry Roberts, uh, Lawrence on the book, but I always go by Larry, and uh, the author of The Great Housing Bubble. Uh, I'm probably better known as Irvine Renter, for any of you that have uh, found my blog, the Irvine Housing Blog. Now, I first started writing for the Irvine Housing Blog back in early 2007. It was as a way to get all of this out there, because none of what was being said in the in the public realm I felt was accurate and certainly wasn't reflecting the truth of what was going to happen in the housing market. So I wrote a series of posts uh, explaining what the real deal was. And uh, the posts became popular and the blog started to grow in its readership. And as I wrote more and more, all of a sudden I realized one day, hey, you know, I've got a structure of a book here. So then in early 2008, I sat down and wrote it. And that's the book that you're looking at today. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm a, a consultant to the land development industry here in Southern California. I'm the director of planning for a local engineering firm called Mayors and Associates. I spend most of my day doing land plans. I tell everybody where, you know, houses go here, the streets go there. That's my primary job. Now, I have been working as a land development consultant my entire career. So uh, residential real estate markets in particular are the ones with which I'm most familiar that has been my education, training, and experience. Uh, as I mentioned, I have a master's degree in land development. And land development is one of those bridge degrees that you take a lot of urban planning, you take a lot of finance, you put the two together. And uh, so you get people who can design things and people who understand uh, the economics of what's going on. So with that background, uh, I was able to see what was happening in the real estate markets and, and run the numbers on it and say, you know what, this just isn't making any sense. And that's what started to clue me in that we were having a bubble. And one thing that was interesting about watching this bubble forum was living here in Irvine is that we were the center of it. A lot of the bubble was inflated by uh, the crazy mortgages, a lot of which were originated right here in Irvine. We probably had the largest concentration of mortgage brokers anywhere in the United States. In particular, the subprime lending, which was kind of the poster child of the housing bubble was all located right here in Irvine. And of course, uh, in Irvine, uh, everybody who was involved uh, was taking out these mortgage products themselves, inflating the value of our real estate. There's an interesting statistic that I like about the real estate in Irvine. From 2001 through 2005, every single year, on average, the median home price went up an amount equal to the median income. So imagine if you were that you got laid off in the 2001 recession. You had no job, but you happened to own a house. You could have remained unemployed from 2001 through 2005, and your house was providing you the same income that you had just lost. And a lot of people were doing just that. They were living off of their houses. They were taking all that appreciation as it came in, and they would spend it. Spent it on cars, vacations, you know, whatever. But it was an astonishing run-up in prices, something that had never been seen before. Uh, I read recently that all books are written in anger, something I had never really contemplated before. I think there's probably a grain of truth to that. Uh, when I wrote this book, uh, I was angry. I was angry at what I was seeing in the housing market. I was angry that I was telling people this was going to be a problem, and I was being ignored. It's like, this is my education and training. This is what I do. And people were looking at me like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, it's different here. Uh, it can't possibly happen. Prices will never go down. I'm like, yeah, right. We'll see. And 
it annoyed me that I was stuck renting. I mean, I <laughs> used to own a house. When I came out here to California and started work, I came out a little bit too late. When I looked at prices, I said, you know what? I cannot afford this. I mean, yeah, I could have gone out and taken out a mortgage and somebody could have got me into the thing, but I couldn't afford it, and I know that it were, that would have ended up for me, so I just chose not to do it. And, I have, and I'm still waiting for prices to come down to where the levels are reasonable that I feel that I can actually get into something that I can afford. So that kind of wound me up a bit. And what else I noticed is that nobody was really writing about this. Uh, there are some decent books out there on the housing bubble or on what was speculated to be a housing bubble at the time most of these were written. And all those books, they look at all the mechanical things, price to income, price to rent, a lot of things that I talk about in the book, but none of them looked at the psychological aspects of it. And one of the things that I always found most fascinating about these financial manias, it's not what people did, it's why they did it. That's the stuff that you look at, it's like, you see people paying you know, $800,000 for a house that was worth $300,000 a few years earlier, and you're like, well, could it have really gone up that much in value? What, what possessed somebody to spend that much money on it? And that was the kind of thing that really got me uh, interested in this and made me decide to write about it. All right, so with that background, let's, let's get to the basics. What is a bubble? What is a financial bubble? Well, the, the, the easy put is prices start going up. When prices start going up, people see, hey, you know what, if I had bought here, I would suddenly have more money. So they buy. Their act of buying makes prices go up. As prices keep going up, more and more people see that prices are going up, so then they buy. And it becomes this self-fueling cycle. It has nothing to do with value. It has nothing to do with anything other than prices are going up and people want to get, capture that price appreciation and make money on it. All financial bubbles have that in common. They are self-fueling feedback loops based on change in price. And once it gets set in motion, that is going to go until there are no more buyers. That's one of the things that we'll talk about here more in a minute. There are certain key beliefs, and this is where you start to get into the psychology that fuel these bubbles. Uh, one is that prices are expected to rise. If you didn't think prices were going to go up, you're not going to buy. So expectation of rising prices is, is fundamental. Prices cannot go down. Well, if you thought it was going to go down, you might actually be afraid to buy it. So if you don't think it can possibly go down, well, then why not? And the, the third one is buy now or you will never be able to get whatever that thing is. If it happens to be a house, you're going to be priced out forever. Those are some of the, the key beliefs that are common to all the bubbles. Uh, all bubbles start by some kind of a cause. There's something that makes prices go up. Now, in residential real estate, prices tend to go up anyway because people make more money, their incomes increase with inflation, they get these you know, 3% cost of living adjustments, whatever that is. So people tend to have more money to bid up prices, so prices will creep up slowly over time in most markets. Well, once prices start going up and people start to see, hey, you know what, prices never go down. Maybe I should buy now or I may not get a chance. You know, all of those beliefs start to get kicked in. But there's usually something they call a precipitating factor that gets the ball rolling. Now, one of the beliefs I mentioned was that real estate always goes up. And it's kind of a mantra among uh, realtors and the people who sell this stuff is that real estate cannot possibly go down. It is the greatest investment ever because no matter how much you pay, it's going to be, you're going to be able to sell it for more later. There's no risk. It can't go down. It's a, it's a sure thing. Well, greed is a powerful motivation for people to buy. And if you really believe that prices can't go down and they're always going to go up forever and you have no risk, there's no prices too high. You could pay a million dollars for a $100,000 house. If you can sell it for a million two in a year from now, what's the difference? So when uh, people are motivated by the greed, they will buy, and the only thing to temper that is the fear that I might be wrong and it might go down. Well, if I don't believe it can possibly go down, I don't have anything that's going to stop me from buying this. So people buy. Uh, but one of the, the, the more pernicious beliefs is that if you don't buy now, you're going to be priced out forever. Uh, in particular, people who sell real estate really like this one because it's a fear motivator. The greed motivator is great, yeah, I want to make a fortune off of buying it, but it's the fear motivator that really gets people to go out and buy. It's like, you know what, if I don't buy this today, I'm going to be stuck with something a lot less and worse if I wait and try to buy tomorrow. Gets people the immediacy of getting out, oh, i got to buy now. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you truly believe that you were going to be priced out and be priced out forever, you're going to go buy. 
And your buying is going to drive up prices. And, it's going to, so is, and everyone being motivated by the same thing is going to drive prices higher and higher and higher. And they will drive them up faster than wages grow. Uh, and like I say, that is one of the primary sales tactics that the people who sell real estate do. And then there's a bunch of supporting beliefs that aren't directly related to it, but they kind of support the overall belief system. You know, one of them is that uh, they aren't making any more land. The implication being that there is going to be a permanent shortage of dwelling units. It's like, well, when you really think about it, the argument's kind of silly because if you can't build out, you can always build up. You know, take a look at the Jamboree Corridor right here that Google's on. There's about 5,000 new units have been built here in the last few years. There's no shortage of land here. I mean, there may be zoning restrictions that make it more difficult to develop, but over the long term, they're either going to build more, land, more units or it's going to become so expensive as a place to live that businesses can't expand and there's going to be less demand for real estate. One way or another, there's going to be an equilibrium. Another one of these beliefs is that everybody wants to live here. I mean, hey, it's California. Isn't the weather great here? It's one of the reasons I live here. And it's kind of a natural desire to want to believe that the place you live is so desirable that people are willing to pay ridiculous sums. Well, the reality is everybody wanted to live there because where you live, prices were going up, and that's what they wanted. Uh, you think of the silliness of that argument, you know, was the place that much less desirable 10 years ago? I think the weather was still just as good in 1997 as it was today when prices were, you know, a third of what they are today. So when you really think about it, that argument, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And one thing that's common to all financial manias is the belief that it's different this time. If you ever find yourself investing in something or thinking about investing in something and you're saying, you know what, it's different this time, don't. I just say, just, just don't do it. Think about, because uh, what happens is traditional methods of valuation break down in a financial mania. Well, people who try to create these methods of valuation will go in and they'll try to invent some new one. It's like, well, gee, this doesn't make any sense. So the, the fundamentals must have changed. Maybe it's different this time and maybe this is what it is. You know, this is Google, so you guys are, are familiar with tech. Think back to some of the things that we saw during the tech bubble in stocks. You had internet companies being valued on what was called their burn rate. They weren't being valued on how much money they made. They were being valued on how quickly they spent their investors' money. When somebody invents a valuation method that says that losing is winning, something is really, really wrong. But that, again, that is typical of the kind of things that you see in a financial mania. It's, everyone thinks it's different this time. So, you know, who really cares? Why are financial bubbles important? Well, if you get caught up in one, you're probably going to lose a lot of money. So it is really important to figure out what these things are, what causes them, and to try to avoid getting into them yourselves. You know, when you look at the, the stock bubble, people who lost in the stock bubble only in, lost what they put in. You're pretty much limited to your investment. If, even if you use margin, you start dropping below what your investment was, your broker is going to close out your accounts and you'll be done, but you're not going to lose everything. Houses are different. There are no stop losses in houses. If that house goes down in value and you're half a million dollars underwater, you're half a million dollars underwater. It just is what it is. You know, at that point, you start having bankruptcies, foreclosures, and a lot of the emotional turmoil that goes along with it, you're going to have divorces. I mean, you've probably have seen the news stories with some of these people that have committed suicide or killed themselves and their family. I mean, the fallout of these things is really, really bad, and it is something that should be avoided. So with that preamble, let's uh, talk a little bit more about housing in general. Let's talk about financing a house. When people go out to buy a house, uh, they'll go figure out what they can afford, <coughs> and they'll just go look in the market, and they'll go buy it. Well, what they can afford is almost completely dependent on how much they can finance. I mean, these are big sums of money. You know, no one's just got half a million dollars lying around. They'll just sit there and write a check for it. So you're going to go out and finance this. The amount that you can finance is going to be dependent on the interest rates and on the loan terms that are being offered. Now, in the book, I talk about uh, uh, interest rates and what are the components of mortgage interest rates. And I'm not going to go into all that here. But there, there's, there's three basic things that go into it. You've got the base rate. You've got an inflation expectation, and you've got the risk premium. Now, all of these things were at historic lows during the bubble. And in all likelihood, interest rates are going to rise. 
Now, right now, the Fed is doing some, some really unprecedented historic things to try to manipulate interest rates, particularly long-term mortgage interest rates, to get them down as low as possible because of this problem. But uh, unless we are going to embark on a permanent subsidy of housing in this way, in all likelihood, interest rates are going to rise in the future. All right, so now let's uh, take a look at how the types of borrowers are classified. You've got, and all, it's all based on FICO score. At the top, you've got your prime borrowers. These are the people with you know, 800 FICO scores. They're, they're the, the cream of the crop. These are the ones that all the lenders want to loan money to because they know they're going to get paid back. Then you've got the people at the bottom of the scale. These are the subprime borrowers. These are people that have a history of not paying their debts and that lenders really don't want to borrow to those, or loan money to those people. And then kind of this gray area in between are the Alt-A borrowers. Uh, this, would, this discussion will become a little important later. I just want you to give you some background into who these people are. And you can also look at the types of loans that are being offered. And there's really three types of loans. You've got loans that amortize, which means each payment that you make, some amount of the principal is being paid back to the lender. And over time, it's paid down to zero. You've got interest-only loans, which are the treading water loans. You're not making any progress, but you're not falling behind. You will owe just as much 10 years from now as you owe today if you take out an interest-only loan. And then you've got the negative amortization loan. Interesting, if I had given this speech 10 years ago, I would not have mentioned this. I mean, I, I, the product probably theoretically existed, but it wasn't given to anybody because it was a crazy loan. Well, it's more commonly known as the option arm, and it was given out to everybody during the bubble. And it is going to be a huge problem with this market going forward as those loans blow up and people all of a sudden have to start making fully amortized payments when they were used to making this tiny little teaser rate payment, all of a sudden they're going to have to make this massive amortizing payment, and they're just not going to be able to do it. Now, there's some other important loan terms that came out of the bubble. Uh, one of them was stated income loans, uh, more affectionately known as liar loans, because people just made up a number. You know, if you, if you went into your mortgage broker and said, you know what, I really want to buy that $600,000 uh, piece of property, and the guy says to you, well, how much do you make? And you tell him. And he says, well, you couldn't afford that. Then he comes back, well, how much would I need to make to be able to afford that? Oh, I got some paperwork that will do that for you. Let's just say you made $180,000. No problem. We'll just fill out the paperwork, say you make whatever you want. Loan will go through. Somebody will fund it. Way on down the line, when you default, you know, we don't care. You, maybe you can refinance. Maybe you can't. Uh, but people were doing that. It was quite common. Uh, skip ahead a little bit here. Uh, another phenomenon of the housing bubble, and this is something I write about a lot on the Irvine Housing blog, is uh, mortgage equity withdrawal. People took the money out of their homes and spent it. A lot of it. This wasn't small dollars we're talking about. It's not like somebody went out and got $10,000 and you know, took a trip or something. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. When you look back in our economy from about 2001 through 2007, there was no real economic growth. There was a huge amount of unsustained borrowing through people borrowing on the inflated value of their homes, and they went out and spent things. It was all borrowed money. None of it was real. People were not actually making that money and spending it out of their income. Our entire economy was one massive Ponzi scheme of ever-increasing debt. And it's the main reason that our entire economy is suffering so badly right now is because the banks have said, you know what, I'm not going to fund this Ponzi scheme anymore. All of a sudden, all that borrowing has dried up. And that's the reason our economy is hurting so bad. When it gets right down to it, all of those kinds of financial innovations are a fallacy. They just simply do not work. Uh, the, the lending industry tries to come up with new affordability products to get people into homes. They think that they're doing this you know, great thing of improving home ownership, and you know, maybe they are. The problem is that they just do not and they cannot work. And the reason is really quite simple. If your payment can go up, there's a good chance that you're not going to be able to afford the new higher payment. And people who cannot afford the new higher payments default. And when they default, they end up in foreclosure. And they're no longer sustaining home ownership. All exotic loan programs have that problem. There is a possibility, and make that more of a distinct probability, that the payment is going to go up and people are going to default, and you're going to have the same mess that we're having right now with huge numbers of foreclosures because people are defaulting on their loans. 
All right, so what is a house worth? Let's shift gears away from finance and just take a look at what are houses worth? You know, how, how would you recognize a bubble? Well, the short answer is a house is worth whatever somebody, whatever somebody else is willing to pay for it. Well, in the long term, what somebody's going to be willing to pay for it is going to depend mostly on what they can finance. And that there are certain fundamentals that go into the housing market that determine what people are going to finance. And the first and foremost of those is going to be their incomes. You finance, you make payments on your loan out of your wage income. So if wages are going up, prices are going up, but prices ought to go up to match the amount of wages going up. If wages are going up a little bit and prices are going up a lot, that's a bubble. So if you look at the ratio of price to income, it's definitely one of the signs of a bubble. The other fundamental of, and, and this is probably the, the best fundamental for measuring what, fund, what residential real estate is really worth is rent, comparative rent. How much does something cost to rent? How much would that same thing cost to own? If these things generally are in balance. In fact, in most markets outside of California, it's actually cheaper to own. Ownership is a burden. You have to pay maintenance. You know, you, the roof might go bad. You've, you've got to worry about insurance. Things can happen to your house. If you're a renter, you don't have to worry about any of those things. Renters have the freedom to come and go as they please. Homeowners are stuck with this ball and chain. Homeownership, absent the crazy ideas of how much money you can make on it, is a burden. And in most markets, there is a premium for rental. Uh, so the, the, whatever the cost of ownership compared to rent is the fundamental value. And what we saw in the real estate bubble was that the cost of ownership was double what you could rent something for. It made no sense to own under those circumstances, other than you believed that by owning, you were going to make a bunch of money because the house was going to go up in value. Um, there are many costs, and I, and I go through all the costs in the book of what the costs of ownership are. A lot of people fail to consider all of these costs. You know, the mortgage payment is the, the largest and most obvious, and, and most people understand that one. But most people also believe, because they get this great tax deduction, that the actual cost of ownership is probably 20% less than what their payment is. The actual, the opposite is true. Even when you factor in the tax savings, if you start to look at maintenance, insurance, and all the other costs of ownership, the cost of ownership actually exceeds your monthly payment by about 20 to 30 percent. Most people grossly underestimate the true costs of ownership, those costs that a renter does not bear that an owner does. Of course, they make up for it. They also gro grossly overestimate how much it's going to appreciate. So I suppose those things cancel one another out. Um, so I mentioned that the, the, the proper valuation is based on price to rent. Typically, in a normal market, that's going to be somewhere between 160 and 200. You know, maybe the, the, the prime properties where you're going to own it for a long time, you can justify uh, 200 times multiple on rent. For the more transitory properties, it's probably less. And if it's property that you're not going to live in, that you actually want to make a positive cash flow on as an investor, the numbers even get slower. At the peak, these numbers were 300 or more, which is uh, uh, crazy from a cash flow perspective. All right, so we've, we've covered some of the basics then. We talked about what a bubble is. Uh, we talked about the different financing options that were out there. And we talked about how houses are valued. So I want to just talk a little bit about the credit bubble. Because really, the real estate bubble was about credit. It was a wild expansion of credit that, infl that just happened to flow into houses. Could have flowed into something else, but houses is where it went, and that's what created the bubble. Now, in the book, I go into some detail about structured finance. I'm not going to try to explain it, explain it all here, because uh, it is one of those topics that's a bit mind-numbingly dull. But it is important to really understanding the, the mortgage market, because it created the infrastructure that allowed all that capital to flow into houses. So I'll leave it to you in the, in the book to, to go into that. Um, all right, so this is, this is an exercise that I go through in the book that, uh, that I'll do here. Uh, nice, nice way to visualize the bubble and the, the, to see from your own point of view, just imagine yourself with the thought process that you'd be going through. Imagine that everyone here in the room and everybody listening is uh, a borrower. And we're going to have an auction where we're going to have some asset, and in this case it'll be a house or a series of houses, that you can bid on. You can borrow 
whatever you want. There's no limitation. You know, you can go and get your liar loans. You can, there's no limit to what you can borrow. Uh, this, this asset that we're going to bid on always goes up in price. It cannot go down. It's always going to go up, and you truly believe that. Uh, if we were to, the only caveat to the whole thing is, whatever you borrow, when you finally sell that thing, you're going to have to pay back. Fair enough. So if we did that, we would hold the first thing up for, for auction. And somebody would bid and say, yeah, I want it. I'll take it. Whatever the price. Half a million? Sure, no problem. And they'll buy it. Well, that's the last one available at half a million. The next one's going to be available for 510000 Someone is going to buy that. It doesn't cost me anything. I can make up whatever number I want, so I'll just buy it. Well, as this starts to happen, everyone else in the room is going to realize, hey, these prices are going up. The guy told us that the prices were always going to go up, and they sure are. Well, I want one. In fact, I better buy now because if I don't buy now, it, I'm not going to get all of the money from it. So then there's going to be competition among the bidding. People are going to become really anxious to have this thing. They're going to bid faster. They're going to bid higher. They're going to, they're going to do whatever they can. I mean, there's, there's no limitation stopping them from bidding. They'll, they'll bid a million dollars. Who cares? It's going to go up. Well, eventually, the prices are going to get really, really high. There, there, there's no connection to what that thing is currently selling for in the market and what it's actually worth. Well, at some point, all of the people in the room have bought. There's no more bidders. And it's like, well, now what? Prices are up here. That, that half a million dollar home is now selling for two million bucks. Uh, where do we go from here? We don't have any buyers. Well, somebody's going to look around and say, you know what? I don't see any buyers. I'm going to sell. So they sell. They, they're they're going to get conserved. They're going to they're cash out. They're, I'd rather have my money back. I'm going to pay off this loan. I don't want to worry about it. I'm just going to cash out. Well, the first guy that cashes out makes the price drop. Everybody else goes in the room and goes, whoa, wait a minute. That wasn't supposed to happen. Prices don't go down. Ah, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. This is a temporary aberration. You know, we made so much money on this thing. If it goes down a little bit, you know, who cares? Well, a couple more people are going to say, you know what, that doesn't seem right. I want to cash out too. I don't want to take any more risk on this. So then they sell and they cash out. Prices continues to fall. People start to get more and more worried. Well, not long after that starts, then the people that bought up here in the peak actually owe more than what the thing's currently selling for in the market. Those people are in trouble. So then they want out and they sell. And when they sell, they can't pay back the loan. Well, that was one of the conditions was that you had to pay back the loan. Once the lenders stop getting paid back, they go, hey, you know what? I don't want to loan on this anymore. I'm losing money here. Well, this is not, this is, was not a good idea. I'm just going to stop loaning. Well, wait a minute. How are people going to bid up these prices now? They, can't, they don't have access to all this borrowed money anymore. Well, then all of a sudden, prices start to really drop. Then widespread panic sets over the room. It's like, oh my, I've got to get out now. If I don't get out now, I'm, I'm going to fall below, and then I'm going to lose all this money. I better sell while I still can. The selling frenzy becomes a panic. As everybody tries to get out now, well, prices are still up here. Prices just absolutely plummet. This is what you see in bubbles of all kinds over and over again. It doesn't really matter what the asset is. It can be houses. You know, they did it with tulips back in uh, the Netherlands back in the what, 1570s or something like that. It really doesn't matter what it is. You know, eventually prices get pummeled so low that it is a bargain. It actually makes sense to buy. Like, for instance, with a house, if all of a sudden that half a million dollar house is selling for 200000 it's like, well, gee, you know, I could rent that thing out more than cover my payment. I could actually make a buck just on renting the thing out. All of a sudden, it becomes cash flow positive. Well, that's another reason to buy. I'm no longer buying just because I'm trying to capture the change in, in the resale price. I now can actually make profit on a thing just renting it month, cash, cash flow month to month. That's the cycle that these things go into over and over and over again, particularly if these things are enabled by lenders. Now, if the lenders don't provide the air, the bubble doesn't get inflated. All right, so I, measured, I mentioned that the, the housing bubble was a bubble. And, and in the book, I go into details of, well, how would you tell? Well. If you can calculate what that fundamental value of real estate is, you know where prices should be. If you just look out in the market and you find out prices are up here, you know that the difference is the bubble. That's how overvalued things are. In the book, I go into all the various measures of house price. It's not as easy as one might think. It's, it's not like a stock that is uniform and traded on exchange. So there are uh, some things in there. One of the things that was interesting when you really looked at uh, fundamental measures of what things were worth and what they became valued at 
you see that nationwide, things were 20 to 30 percent overvalued. And in California, which is one of the more extreme markets, you were 40, 50 percent or more overvalued at the peak. That means that if you had just the next day cut prices down to their fundamental values, you'd have cut them in half. In some markets, they're already cut in half, particularly if you get out into the fringe markets where things are less desirable, you have long commute times and some of those kind of things. Uh, prices are down 60, 70 percent or more. And that's kind of the nature of these fringe markets. Once, uh, once the prime markets start to crash, those fringe markets get abandoned by people that no longer want to have that commute if they can get the cheap real estate here. So we talked about that. Another one of the ways that you can uh, tell, and I, and I go into some detail on this, is uh, the debt to income ratios that people are using. Uh, the debt to income ratio is what percentage of your income that you're putting toward a house. Now, when prices start going up, people will put more and more of their income toward housing because they want to capture that appreciation. You know, greed's kicking in. So they're willing to sacrifice some of their income to, to get the benefits of the house going up. Well, when the prices start to crash, the opposite of, is true. People, why would you stretch yourself and put 50% of your gross income toward a house when things are going to be dropping $100,000 in value? People don't. So they, the volume, housing, the, the sales volume drops off and people put smaller and smaller percentages toward buying real estate because the primary motivation, which was to capture appreciation, is gone. So like I mentioned, when the bubble bursts, uh, the market runs out of buyers. And uh, one of the things that, that's been talked about in this ongoing, now in the bubble burst, is the arm resets. These adjustable rate mortgages were, were given out in droves during the bubble uh, as an affordability thing. People couldn't afford to take on the more conservative 30-year fixed rate conventionally amortized mortgages, so they went out and got interest onlys that might have been fixed for three years, five years, 10 years, whatever. Or they went out and got these option arms where they didn't even have to make that much of a payment. Well. At some point, lenders want to get their money back. So at some point, whether it's uh, five years, 10 years, or whatever down the road, that loan recasts to a fully amortized payment. So for instance, if you got one of those five-year fixeds, after five years, that's gonna, that payment is going to change, and it's going to recast to where that you have to pay off the full balance over the remaining 25 years on the original 30-year note. Well. That's a four, that, we've done the math on this, and that comes out to about a 40% increase in your housing payment. You know, it's not like your house has changed, and you just got to pay 40% more for it every month. Well, most people stretched to get into the thing to begin with. You know, if you've already stretched and then it goes up 40%, you have no hope. You're going to default. And people did. Uh, subprime went first. And it wasn't because these people are less savvy about making their payments, although to some degree they are, they wouldn't have been some prime, but it was because their, arm, their adjustable rate mortgages reset in 2007 and 2008. That's why the fringe areas and the areas that were dominated by subprime mortgages, their prices have just been blasted back to the stone ages. And you go out to, and I'll go into Redfin, I'll go look at San Jacinto and uh, some of these fringe markets out in Riverside County, and you can find prices that are 70% off. New construction, stuff that was built in 2005 you know, for 70% less than that guy paid for it. Well, the, the Prime and the Alt-A and the other customers that live in more desirable areas, they have the very same problem. The only reason you haven't seen those markets crash as hard as the subprime markets is because all of the loans given to these people aren't due to reset until 2009, 10, and 11. So it's the exact same set of circumstances that caused subprime to blow up, except for this time it's going to be Prime. And there's no, it's very likely that these people are not going to be able to refinance because since subprime did blow up, it lowered prices. So if these people go in to refinance, they're not going to have the 20% equity in the property anymore that they're going to need in order to refinance. So they're not going to be eligible. So they're going to face that full increase in payment because they can't just serially refinance from one teaser rate, one loan into another and take that out for infinity, which is what their plan was and what they were hoping was going to occur. <coughs> All right. So, uh, pardon me just a minute. I get on a roll. I really do need a drink of water. All right. I want to talk about the, the credit crunch. 
As I mentioned, we're going through the example. This credit crunch is really not that difficult to understand. Lenders give out money. If they don't get paid back, they stop. Th that is the basic of a credit crunch. Lenders are not loaning money because people stopped paying them back. If everybody had just continued to make their payments on these mortgages, there wouldn't have been a credit crunch. They would have gone on just keep making these mortgages. They, in fact, they even kept on making these mortgages even after people started to default. It wasn't until it got really bad that all of a sudden they collectively woke up one morning in August of 2007, and it literally happened in a day where they just said, no, done, we're not doing this anymore. Everybody collectively woke up at the same time. And from that point forward, it's been very difficult to obtain financing for real estate. And that's not going to change. In fact, we call it a credit crunch because it was restrictive compared to what it was in the bubble, but those programs in the bubble were not sustainable. All we're doing is returning back to the standards that we used to have prior to when things got insane. In all likelihood, we're not going to go back to those crazy standards of the bubble. And the main reason is, is we tried that once. It didn't work. People defaulted. Banks lost a trillion dollars. Our entire banking system is insolvent right now. I mean, that's kind of the dirty little secret that you kind of hear bandied around in the, in the mainstream media. All of our banks are worth less, their assets are worth less than their liabilities. They're, they're broke, they're bankrupt. Only reason that they're still alive is because the Federal Reserve just kind of keeps feeding them money. You know, they're just zombie banks at this point. Uh, so, uh, that's, oh, one more thing I want to say about that. that. That's why we have a credit crunch. Now, one of the, the things that was the worst that came out of the lending that really hurt the housing market was 100% financing. When it was brought in, everybody hailed it. Oh, this is the greatest thing ever. People don't have to save for down payments anymore. You know, this is great. We can put people into houses. You know, all these people that you know, don't have the financial discipline to save, they can <coughs> own. Oh, this is great. Well, what happened was is it changed the incentives in the, the market. People stopped saving money. If you look at a graph of personal savings rate going back to the 50s, you've got this straight line at about 8, 10% for years and years and years. And all of a sudden, you've got this line that just drops off to zero. It was negative. People just stopped saving. What was the point? Why am I going to sacrifice and, and you know, bust myself to save all this money when I can just go have it now? So what ended up happening is all those people that would have been saving, that would have been buying homes in 2008, 9, 10, they all got pulled forward, and they all bought in 2005 and 2006. And what was worse is they were pulled forward, put into houses they couldn't afford, and now they're bankrupt. So now we've destroyed that entire buyer pool. We have nobody that was saving for down payment. The people that would have been saving for down payment and are trying to get into these homes were put into homes, and then their credit was ruined, so they'll never be able to, or they won't be able to buy for several years. So now we're in that no man's land where the buyer pool is a tiny fraction of what it used to be before. And it's why we have very low volume in residential real estate right now. Um, I said one of the things that made the, this book unique was when I talked about the, the psychology of the housing markets. And I, I go into a lot of detail on uh, all the issues of why people did what they did. And I think that's the thing that really sets this book apart from any of the others that makes it not just a dry technical analysis. You got to get into people's heads and see what they were thinking. <coughs> um, I want to say to briefly, one of the things that uh, I talk about there is the difference between speculation and investment. And, I, and I've touched on it earlier, but I mentioned it again, that speculators are people that want to profit based on the change in the resale value of the house. I'm going to buy it at a half a million because I know it's going to go up to a million. And I'm going to make that half a million bucks. That's the speculator mindset. You're only profiting based on change in price. Investors are people that buy irrespective of what the resale price is going to be. They're buying for positive cash flow from the day they buy it. So they're going to pay like for a house. They'll go out and buy it as a rental property, pay such a small amount for it that they can rent it out for more than what money's coming in. The reason this becomes important is because if you look at the psychology of a speculator, uh, most people who try it are going to lose. Because let's look what happens. Let's say you're a speculator and you think something's going to go up, so you buy it. Well, sure enough, if it does go up, you want more of it. You're like, wow, that was cool. I made a bunch of money. Let me have two of those. Well, let me have three. Let me have four. Let me have as much of that as I can possibly get. 
If the thing is going up in value, I want more, 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 more. It's just human nature. When, if, it's, if it's rewarding you, you're going to want more of it. Well, that causes people to buy when, pro when profits are available to them, and they really need to be thinking about selling. So then when prices start going down, they lapse into denial. I mean, they were so rewarded for having bought it that the fact that prices are going down, it's like, oh, you know, don't, don't worry, no big deal. This is not going to be a problem. And they'll hang on to it right through the entire decline, right past their entry point to where now that they, it's worth less than they paid for it. And they're like, ooh, and I don't like that so much right now. In fact, actually, this is kind of causing me pain. You know, if I were to sell this thing, I'd lose $100,000, and that would not be good. But, well, yeah, hang on, it's not that painful yet. Well, then it keeps dropping, it keeps dropping, it keeps dropping, until finally it reaches their pain threshold. And what do you do when you're in pain? You push it away. I don't want any more of that. Get rid of this thing. Sell, sell, get me out of this thing. So what ends up happening? If you're a speculator, you're going to buy at the wrong time. When profits are available to you, you're not going to sell. And then when it becomes painful and you're actually going to take a loss, you're going to dump the thing and you're going to sell it. Speculators who follow their emotions lose every time. Uh, and that is one of the things that people are discovering painfully uh, who speculated during the real estate bubble. One of the things in... Uh, uh, I, I found it interesting in, in studying the psychology of this, and I, I, I wrote about this on the blog, and I wrote about it again in the book, was some of the beliefs that, that people held that I, I called them a cultural pathology. Because they're, 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 they're crazy when you, when you just really look at them. But people have rationalized why it makes sense. One is that appreciation is income. That if my house goes up in value, that's free money for me to spend. Like it was just like I earned it. I mean, come on. Uh, Credit is savings. You know, I don't have anything in my savings account, but I've got this $40,000 credit line, so I can go out and spend it. Well, and since you could convert that appreciation to savings and go spend it as, as income, it seemed, seemed perfectly logical to people. Another favorite is debt is wealth. You know, people go out with 100% financing, buy a million dollar home, and think that they're rich. Well, you haven't improved yourself, you haven't improved your net worth any. You've just managed to take on a huge loan and lever yourself into something really expensive. It doesn't make you rich, it just makes you in a lot of debt. But you know, somehow people don't, uh, don't like to make that distinction. All right, I spent a whole chapter talking about uh, how prices are going to go down, how much they're going to go down, all the different methods. And that's when you get into the dry technical stuff with all the charts and graphs about, yeah, this line's going to intersect that line. And, uh, it provides a, you know, a, a structural fundamental basis for why I came up with the numbers that I did. Uh, like I say, if you're really interested in that and want to take your own guess at it, read that chapter. That'll tell you more about it. Um, last couple of minutes, what I want to talk about was the, the final chapter was about preventing the next housing bubble. Um, as I mentioned before, it needs to be done. I mean, is anyone enjoying this recession? I mean... Are the foreclosures a good time for anybody? I mean, there's lo so many problems that come out of this that we really need to do something. And in that last chapter, I talked about what caused the bubble and what doesn't cause the bubble, because you really need to make sure that the, any solutions to this thing are targeted and actually solve the problem rather than creating a whole bunch of new problems, which is what the government is really good at doing. Oh, let's go ahead and write the solution. Oh, it's got 12 other problems. Oh, do you know? We've got a real problem. We don't need to go there. Um, one of the things that I identify is that the, the underlying problem in this was our appraisal system. Our system of appraising residential real estate enables irrational buying. Because what happens is, if somebody pays a ridiculous amount for a property, an appraiser is going to take a look at, well, that was the comparative sale for this neighborhood, so that's going to justify the loan for the next guy. It has nothing to do with underlying value. It's all a matter of what was paid. Well, if a bunch of fools way overpay, each one is enabling the next one to do the same. It's the very definition of irrational exuberance. And it is encapsulated and enshrined right into our appraisal process. The, the thing that I suggest was to change our method of appraisal to go with an income approach. Now, people who know appraisals know this is how commercial real estate is appraised all the time. It doesn't matter what somebody paid for a previous uh, thing of commercial real estate. The bank is going to know what's the, th what's the cash flow and are you going to be able to pay me back. The same method needs to be taken with residential real estate. Because if loans had been limited to what the rental income of the property would have been, 
There's no way that some of these loans on properties that were worth, based on their rental income, 400 grand, there would have been an $800,000 mortgage put onto that property. The reason this is important, it's not necessarily going to stop all bubbles, but it's going to stop bubbles being built with the banker's money, which is why we're in such a catastrophic problem with our economy right now, because our entire banking system is broke. If the bankers aren't risking their money, you know, somebody can risk their own money, and it's their money to lose. Hey, more power to them. If you've got half a million dollars lying around and you want to pay that much more than what something's worth for it, knock yourself out. But by having the banks be so heavily involved with it, it puts our entire economy at risk because we need banks to function in order for our economy to work. Um, one of the other uh, solutions I look at are some of the regulatory solutions. Uh, changing the appraisal method isn't something that would require a lot of regulation. It would just require that the people who make and service these loans to just decide this is how we're going to do it. On the regulatory side, I think that home mortgage loans should have that debt to income ratio capped. People should not be allowed to take out a loan that requires 50% of their gross income. I mean, if you're making that kind of a payment, what are you doing? Are you living on ramen noodles every night and not going out? I mean, there, there's no money left to live a life because if half of your gross, this isn't your take home, this is your gross, you know, you got this tiny little bit of take home left. You have nothing. Everything is going to your housing. People default. I mean, it's been proven over and over again. When, when you start increasing those debt to income ratios, if they can't borrow from other sources to Ponzi scheme the payments, they're going to default. And that's one of the reasons we're having such high default rates. Another thing that I'd suggested was, uh, all people should be qualified based on a 30-year conventionally amortized mortgage. No more qualifying people for larger sums based on interest only. Now, I suppose there's probably some reason to keep the interest only product around, but if you're not going to be able to make them finance more because they still have to be able to afford the amortized payment, it's not going to have much of a future as an affordability product. And I would also make it so that uh, the combined loan to value of all of the mortgages on a property should never be more than 90%. Because one of the big problems that we have now is with all the 100% financing that was given out and prices started to fall and all these people fell underwater, they all defaulted, or they're all continuing to default. The statistics show it's almost a parabolic rise. When people start falling underwater, they, the, the rate of default just goes orbital because they don't see any point in staying. It's worth less than they're paying for it, and they're overpaying, so they, they just get out. So I would make that change. And uh, one of the ways I would do that is... I would say these are the standards. If a bank or a, some kind of a lender loans somebody money in excess of that amount, the person doesn't have to pay it back. If you put that in place, you wouldn't need any government regulators to regulate and watch over this thing. So I'll guarantee you the borrowers would police it really well because as soon as somebody was foolish enough to make them a loan outside of those standards, they would just go petition for debt relief. So there's no way that any lender would do that. And kind of as a give back for that kind of thing, uh, there should be much more stringent penalties for mortgage fraud. One of the things that we saw a lot of in the bubble was mortgage fraud. People, you know, stated income loans were approved mortgage fraud. It was actually encouraged mortgage fraud. It's still fraud. People were staying, saying they made more than they really did. All of those things need to be taken out because those things are just killing the secondary mortgage market. So those are some of the suggestions that I make in the book. Um, I guess it's a way to wind down. I would just like to say uh, thank you all for having me here. I greatly appreciate it, and I just sat there and babbled for 50 minutes. There are probably a few questions. If anybody uh, has anything you'd like to ask, this uh, would be the time. Hi, uh, my name is Michael. I just had a quick question. What In those what you call desirable neighborhoods where people mm -hmm. are in the option arms mm -hmm. and they're going to be resetting in 09, 10, and 11, mm -hmm. what is their psychology at this point? How many of them realize this is coming? Um, if you're thinking about buying, what is your recommendation to get a sense of when things are reaching some normalcy? Um, most of the people in the high-end neighborhoods are still in denial. They haven't seen a whole lot of price drops, and they figure, they figure that because their neighborhood is desirable, it's not going to go down. Um, most of these people, particularly with the option arm, because these teaser rates were so low, they probably actually are paying less each month than they could have rented for. It's just not something that can be sustained. So a lot of these people are just going to stay right to the bitter end. And uh, one of the things I, I didn't go into, but I mentioned in the book, is that that's also one of the things where they have all these bailout talks. So all these bailout talks are about convincing people 
stay in denial. Go ahead. Just keep making your payments. That's all we really care about. So denial is fed. These people are probably going to stay in there until foreclosure and get pushed out. Uh, my recommendation, particularly in any of these high-end neighborhoods, is just wait. Uh, if you're looking at buying a less expensive property, maybe even some investment properties, there are properties out there that cash flow positive right now, all the areas that were subprime, because those, those prices have just been obliterated. The high end is still coming yet. So I, at this point, I would just say, wait, at least in those neighborhoods. question was on uh, investor fraud. How widespread was it? Uh, people were flipping, people uh, were buying multiple properties. Uh, that's one of the things that's kind of been an ongoing uh, thing that I analyze on the I Refined Housing blog is how much of this is really going on. And it was everywhere. Because like I said, when you think about what the speculator mentality was, it was going up in value. I want more of it. No one's stopping me from getting more of it. So people were buying <coughs> multiple properties. Part of the fraud that was going into that was you know, they were lying on their income to be able to, to support it. And also, each of these people was claiming it as their primary residence uh, because the rates were a little bit lower. So you got people out there with probably 10 primary residences. You know, how they managed to pull that off. So one of the phenomena that we're seeing, and I, and I, just, actually, I did a post on this last week, was when these people implode, <coughs> they'll dump four properties all at once onto the market. So you see these mini implosions happening all over the place where the, you'll have you know, four lists. I had one of them last week. That's four listings the same day from the same owner. Uh, Scott, I saw a presentation by the Rich Dad, Poor Dad fellow, <laughs> where one of his suggestions was if you want to get a whole bunch of rental properties, a good way to do it is to estimate the income you could get as a, a range, and then take the top end of it, add 20%, and claim that as current income. I said, by this means, you can easily own five, six, even 10 properties without any questions. Yeah, and if you can, if you can get a bank to sign off on that, <laughs> you could probably pull it off and you could probably acquire these properties. But again, that is a speculative play because the only reason you do that is because you're betting that things are going to go up in value. I mean, if it really truly doesn't have positive cash flow, you're not investing, you're speculating. Uh, <laughs> there, there's no end to some of the silly things that people out there putting these programs together will convince people. You know. No money down, you know, roll these things over, you know, take out strange mortgages. It's all out there. And that people were actually having some success with it for a while. Uh, personally, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I, would you also add to the, the term convince people that people don't need convincing when it comes to greed? Because it seems like I, I see too much of people being the victim, and I'm sure there are victims out there. But when you have a system set up where there's no um, responsibility needed to buy a house, so for example, if I'm going to get out of my house, I'll stop paying rent. I'll have six, seven months of free savings. Yeah. Then I'll have the bank pay me $10,000 to leave my house as long as I don't tear it up when I leave. Mm -hmm. So there is no disincentive other than, oh, my credit score is going to hurt. Well, that's a big whoop because you'll still get offers from credit card companies in the mail. Right. So when you have a system set up with absolutely no disincentive, like, you know, if you, you can't just go BK and just say, I can't pay anything, right? They're mm -hmm. going to come after you. Mm -hmm. But they don't do that in the housing market. Uh, what do you think about that? That's uh, definitely one of the huge problems. Uh, you would think that because there was no disincentive on the borrower's side, that that would make the lenders more conservative. That's the thing that really surprised me in particular in California, was that we're a non-recourse state, which means that you can go out and borrow as much as you want, and the lender cannot come after you for any deficiency. What that is supposed to do is make the lenders more conservative and not issue stupid loans because they know they have no other way to get it back. The lenders are supposed to be the adults in the transaction. Borrowers are like little kids. Just give me the candy. I want, the, I want it, I want it, I want it. The lenders are supposed to be the ones that say, you know what, I don't know if you can pay this back. Well, if they start abdicating their responsibility and there are no uh, disincentives for borrowers to borrow <coughs> as much as they want, you're going to have some of the craziness that we saw. Uh, I had somebody suggest to me the other day that we should have a, a carrot and stick approach to uh, uh, giving out these loans. They should make it so that not just are they all recourse, but that you can't bankrupt out of them. You know, it's like when you, anyone has got stu student loans debts, no, you can't bankrupt out of a student loan debt. I guess they figure they can't repossess your brain so that, you know, they're going to make sure that you pay that no matter what. Well, uh, 
if you couldn't re if you couldn't bankrupt your way out of housing debt, maybe a few people might think twice about taking on that housing debt. I suspect when they get caught up in a financial mania, they'd do it anyway. But uh, yeah, that is definitely one of the big problems: is that there is no disincentive for taking on huge amounts of money. Uh, but again, I, I personally think that that's probably one of the things that should be put into the court of the lenders. That, like I say, they're the ones that should be knowing about if they're going to get their money back. Anybody uh, else? So you, so you talked about um, how the government, the Fed, is trying to manipulate interest rates to try to keep them low so people mm -hmm. will be buying. Uh, they're talking about increasing the, the tax credit for new buyers and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think are the, the long-term consequences? of Like, is it actually going to work, or is it just delaying the inevitable? Or? Um, if it's successful, and if they can implement that, if they can you know, put in these tax credits and lower interest rates down to 4 4.5%, four what it will probably do is it may, it'll delay things, particularly if they can uh, allow more people to actually take advantage of that and refinance. You may have fewer foreclosures. The primary thing that I see it is going to do is, and particularly if you look at some of the subprime areas, the places that have just been just pummeled with their pricing, if you can make it attractive enough that these cash flow investors come in and mop up these properties, that's going to put a floor in the market. It's not going to help the high-end stuff. The high-end stuff is still overinflated. I mean, that, that is going to crash. I mean, there, there's just nothing that's going to stop that at this point. But for the low-end stuff, some of the things that have distressed neighborhoods, that have nobody living in them, that are becoming eyesores, that are becoming public nuisances, that, you know, you've got gangs putting in their meth labs in the houses and stuff like that, that could be fixed by putting in some of these programs. Uh, it's really kind of a giveaway to the people that already have money that could, could invest in those things. Is if you're getting a $15,000 tax credit, it's like, yeah, I'll take 10 of them, you know? I mean, and there are people that are going to go out and do that. But for stabilizing the bottom of the market, uh, that's probably not a bad thing. More? Hi. Something I'm a little curious about <coughs> in the foreclosure process. Mm -hmm. Why are the banks buying these properties back up at auction? Why do they think they can sell it for more than what you know, the market rate is set at auction. Okay. Um, I have a whole chart in the book that outlines the foreclosure process. Everybody wants to look through, you know, this is followed by that, and you've got 90 days, and all these different notices that happen. Um, typically, a bank, a bank will have what they call these loss mitigation procedures, which says, all right, you do this, you do that, and we're, all, all of these procedures are about trying to make them not lose so much money. Uh, part of those procedures is that they will typically go to an auction and they will bid the price up to their loan amount. You know, they typically will have a first mortgage that's 80% of the purchase price, so they'll go up there and bid right to their mortgage amount and pray that somebody outbids them. They do not want these properties. All they want is their money back. And in most markets, prices haven't dropped 20%, obviously without an absence of a real estate bubble, these little mitigation processes work pretty well because what happens is the bank bids up to 20% and then some other flippers will come in that have cash and they'll you know, buy for a little more. Uh, the market is thinner at auction because you've got to have people that are going to write a cashier's check for the full amount. Not everybody just wanders around with half a million dollars in their checking account. So since the market is thinner, there are fewer buyers, the prices tend to be lower. So the, the flipper uh, MO is that you go to auction, you write your half a million dollar check, you buy this property, you put it on the MLS where somebody can then finance that transaction and they'll probably pay 10-15% more. If you do it quickly enough, even in a declining market, if you can buy it down here and you can quickly sell it before it you know, takes you back out from underneath you, uh, you can actually make a buck. And uh, I see that even now that people are, are, are doing that. One of the things I have noticed in the last year or so is that it used to be right at the first that started to collapse that the banks were just automatically following their loan mitigation procedures and paying you know, the 80% and they were acquiring all these properties at foreclosure. Well, somebody finally wised up and said, you know what, why don't we just let that drop another 10% and take our 10% loss at the courthouse steps rather than holding it, trying to sell it, paying all these other fees and falling that much farther behind. So the banks have been dropping the amount that they're bidding and being willing to take a loss right at the courthouse steps. But even with doing that, they're still acquiring lots of these properties. Where are they down to? 70%? 60%? I've seen it down to 60%, even in nice neighborhoods. Uh, you, you go to some of the subprime neighborhoods, and they will go even lower than that. I, I had one the other day that I profiled that was bought by the bank for 40% off of the peak price. 
So that would have been at least a 20% drop off of their full first mortgage. And they still bought it. I mean, so they, they didn't want it, but nobody was even willing to bid higher. Hi, you, you've talked about detecting the, the bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the inverse? How about, how do we know a particular market's oversold and it's a good time to buy? The, if you take a look at a particular property and you have a good idea of what it's going to rent for, if your total cost of ownership is less than that, it's overshot the fundamentals. It is a good buy. In fact, uh, I will personally buy probably before the bottom. Because once prices overshoot, now as a renter, you're actually paying that premium for renting. It actually makes more sense to buy at that point than it does to rent. As soon as you start seeing that becoming a widespread phenomenon, you know that we're very close to or at the bottom and you're seeing an overshoot of fundamentals, particularly if desirable properties actually get down there. Condos, yeah, they're going to go down there because people don't want to live in them. But if you see a, a nice single family detached, three bedroom, two bath home selling for the cost of ownership being less than the cost you could rent it for, that's an overshoot of fundamentals. And that could happen if the buyer pool remains very small because nobody qualifies for a loan and the number of foreclosures is massive, which it is. So there's a really good chance that you're going to see overshoot of these fundamentals at the bottom until you get enough people to come in and buy up that inventory and absorb it all. <coughs> I have a question from BC. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, what do you think, do you think hyperinflation is going to change some of these fundamentals that you're talking about? That if we were to increase the money supply, would all these folks um, that might be suffering from a fallout suddenly benefit from this? That is one possible outcome. What you're going to see with Fed policy, now, you know, right now, Fred's lowered interest rates to zero. And the Fed is printing money as fast as they possibly can. I mean, they are just printing, printing, printing. That is how we're solving all of our problems is through printing money. Well, at some point, the economy is going to come out. And when that comes out, the Fed is going to start pulling that money back out of the system. If you have that hyperinflation, <laughs> people who owe money benefit. You want to be a borrower in times of high inflation because the money that you're going to be paying back 5, 10, 20 years from now is going to be worth a lot less than the money you have today. Uh, of the three alternatives, I think the, the Fed is probably going to err on the side of inflation than they will on the side of kicking us back into another uh, recession. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in general, well, in, in general, I'd say no, but there are, there are specific instances where a HELOC is probably advisable. Uh, I'd probably say, let me qualify that. If you're borrowing from your HELOC to actually do home improvements, you're probably adding 50 cents to 70 cents on a dollar for every dollar that you put into the home improvement. So at least then you're not totally flushing the money down the toilet if you, if you go that route. Uh, at, what you should do is if you're going to borrow the money from your house to improve your house, don't borrow more than 50 to 70 cents on a dollar of that improvement, and then you put in the rest of it yourself. That way, at least you've added value equal to what you added to the HELOC. Now, the other alternative would be is if you could actually take that money out and invest it and make a greater return than you're paying on uh, the mortgage. Well, that isn't very easy. A lot of people think that sounds like a great sophisticated financial management tool, but in practice, what if you had taken out your HELOC in 2007 and put it in the stock market? How are you feeling about that right now? So uh, it's a lot easier said than done. As a general rule, I don't think it's a good idea at all to take out a HELOC because when you get right down to it, borrowing a dollar and paying a dollar in, you know, paying a dollar in interest, even if it saves you a quarter on your taxes, you're still net behind 75 cents. What benefit did you get from that? Uh, one of the greatest misnomers that I always keep seeing is that people think that uh, it is a sophisticated financial management technique to increase your debt. That's crazy. You are getting a, a quarter in tax break for a dollar that you've spent. You're far better off with no debt. I have a question. Did yeah. Any, um, from there? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah. 
It's, uh, it's been surprisingly little, actually. Uh, in fact, I just this morning, uh, before I came here, had a meeting with the president of uh, one of the major land development companies uh, here in uh, Orange County. And it's gotten to the point that there's pretty much widespread acceptance within our industry. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, we, we had a bubble. Uh, when I first started blogging for the first year and a half, I remained anonymous because I did not want to experience the backlash from the people in my industry who were not too pleased at what I had to say. Now that my industry has gotten to the point of acceptance, uh, people are actually like, oh, yeah, you, you were telling the truth. Could you tell us more about what happened? And that's been the reception that I've been getting, fortunately. <laughs> I'm ready now. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you quickly c clarify why there's a timing difference between resets on the subprime loans versus the, the ones you've been talking about with the Alt-A and the, the prime loans? Okay. Why is there a lag time there? <coughs> the, uh, the lag time was created by the fact that the, the terms of those different loans when they were issued were, were different. The loan that the subprime people were put into was called a 228. It had a two-year rate lock, followed by at the end of two years, there was a reset where uh, the rate went up and the loan was amortized over the remaining 28 years. That's how it got the 228. Well, since that initial period was only two years, and almost all of these were issued in 2005 and 2006, they all reset in 2007 and 2008. Now, the, the people that took out the option arms and uh, all the other interest-only loans most often were on three, five, seven, and 10-year schedules. They were taken out at the same time, but particularly since the five-year was the most common, that put back the reset from the two-year ones. So you had all your resets happening in 2009, 10, and 11. And uh, since that chart was first put out, a lot of people have refinanced, and all they've done is just dragged out the tail of this thing. I mean, they just kicked the can down the road for the foreclosure problem. Uh, I mean, there's some of them that actually had the wherewithal to finance and do a 30-year fixed rate conventionally amortized mortgage. Most didn't. Most just said, you know what, I'm going to do this serial refinancing thing again. You give me, the, you give me another interest only? I'll, I'll worry about that in five years when that one blows up. <laughs> well, you know, if that's the way you want to manage your finances, you can only lead a horse to water. Uh, but that's the reason for the difference, is that the, the, the loan terms were slightly different uh, between the two. Anybody else? Great. For those of you who are lucky enough to get books, if you'd like to have them signed, we'll, um, we can start forming a line over here, like here. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Thank you.